Um, hi, I'm Ed Anna from Apogee, and I remembered to introduce myself. I apparently had forgotten to do that on uh, Friday's, uh, uh, excuse me, on, on the Monday uh, lightning talk. Um, so we've got a bunch of folks up here, and uh, there's a reason for that, because what we're going to be talking about is um, uh, the new route services capability in Cloud, Cloud Foundry. And uh, uh, that's been a collaborative effort. It's um, involved um, uh, a lot of the work that, uh, that Pivotal has, uh, has done on it over the last year, and uh, Apogee uh, has been uh, privileged to help collaborate on that, bring a lot of um, API management uh, use cases to the table and do the first implementation um, of, uh, of API management uh, integrated into, uh, into Cloud Foundry uh, by way of, uh, of route services. And so when we um, planned this session, we, uh, we wanted to really give you kind of a, uh, an overview of, of uh, you know, what uh, APIs and API management within uh, Cloud Foundry is all about and um, uh, show you how it works and then uh, have, um, uh, you know, some uh, real world use cases based on uh, what the uh, team from uh, GE Digital um, uh, has done uh, uh, with it. So, um, uh, as a consequence, we've got a content-packed session here that we're going to try to race through. Um, so, uh, you know, most of you uh, know uh, what an API is. Um, it is a contract. It's how software talks to, uh, to other software. Um, uh, we all sort of know aspirationally what, um, uh, why we use APIs. Uh, they should be straight, uh, simple, straightforward to use. Um, you know, specifically in the context of this, we're talking about web APIs. Uh, interesting thing, uh, statistic that um, uh, I saw uh, was that uh, over half of um, uh, developers today are, are actually producing web APIs that other developers are integrating. So uh, web APIs are, are probably something that most of you in this room um, are, are actually are actively coding software for. Um, in terms of what goes into modern APIs, you know, you can debate this, you know, day in and day out. Over over at Apogee, we do that um, quite a bit. Most of our customers are planning uh, APIs, uh, API initiatives, programs in some form, designing their APIs. Um, uh, you know, beyond the basics, um, most people today tend to agree that they should be JSON based. If you're still building XML APIs in 2016, you're probably um, well, you probably have a good reason for it, but um, I, I don't know what that is. Um, it's probably because somebody made you do it. Um, you know, generally people are sort of converging around OAuth um, uh, and so forth around that. What's the, uh, the challenge? So a lot of what we talk about here um, at the conference is about scaling, um, uh, you know, scaling the execution uh, of, uh, of of your software, of your workloads, and so on. But there's another challenge in scaling, which is uh, scaling the adoption of your software, being able to connect it to your users in uh, the various locations uh, that they might be uh, operating from, perhaps from uh, mobile applications running on their phones, or uh, might be um, uh, the businesses that your company uh, partners with, where you have to interchange data, and so forth. So. Um, you know, as you're probably, uh, you know, dealing with as you look to solve that, APIs are the mechanism uh, by which you do that. And so this is all a, uh, you know, sort of a, a setup for the fact that API development is probably a big part of what you're building uh, within uh, Cloud Foundry. And so uh, when we started talking to, uh, to Pivotal about this um, really about 18 months ago, um, uh, you know, we said, well, there needs to be some way of uh, deeply embedding the API management capabilities that make this all possible in an elegant way into Cloud Foundry that uh, is part of your application lifecycle. And route services emerged out of those conversations as a way to, to do that seamless integration. So with that in mind, let me turn things over to Richard. Thanks, Ed. Clicker. I'm Richard Sirota. I work at Pivotal. I'm a recovering vice president from somewhere else. I uh, want to talk to you today a little bit about route services and the importance of those and what we've 
built around those specifically to help you actually inject something into the route path. Now, I'll make a quick confession. I occasionally drive to work to Seattle, and you zone out for a few minutes, right? You're listening to music, you're listening to a podcast. I, I don't know, I could have run over a duck, missed a tornado. Like, you're completely in the zone. And you get to work and you realize you, you know, something just happened because the route kind of gets boring over time. What I found interesting with route services is there's a lot that goes on in a route and you take that stuff for granted. You know, a lot's going on and what we do with route services is actually making that, that commute a little more interesting. So with route services, actually making it possible to inject something into that request path. So it's not just traffic coming into the system. It's being able to do some things with it along the way. We'll talk about some examples and obviously see a really a nice demonstration of that. But this also gives a pretty cool opportunity for marketplace services, not just things you may buy from, from Apogee or others, but even doing user-defined things. Make up your own service. Be able to introduce that within your organization and add it as a broker so that anybody else can consume your particular service, and we'll talk about some examples. The whole point of all of this is developers need to be going faster. I don't want to open up a ticket and beg the poor API management administrator to add a policy for me and deploy my service. That is not making me go faster, that's making me frustrated. So instead, the whole idea should be how am I helping developers self-service their way into more realistic, high-functioning applications? If I'm not meeting that goal, then we're not doing the right things. So we take that step back and we talk about a route and again, route can be a very unsexy, you know, it just kind of magically happens, but a lot of stuff happens on the route. I mean, this is how do things come in and go to my application? And in these sort of very dynamic container-driven solutions, that is not trivial. Containers are coming and going. I'm scaling instantaneously, and then traffic is magically finding its way to the right place. That's awesome stuff. There's a lot of smarts that happen underneath the covers. And that's why you need these sort of dynamic capability, is because routes are changing constantly because what's underneath the covers changes. So how do I point to the right things? That matters a lot. And developers have some control. You can use your CF commands and create routes and bind routes to a service and do wildcard routes. You can do a number of pretty cool things that, frankly, I didn't even realize till a few weeks ago. So a lot of really interesting things you can do with a particular route. The key, though, is then how do I do something even more interesting with that? So when you look at route services, three kind of core use cases we've thought about is as we think about performance and reliability. How am I doing things around caching? How can I inject caching into a route and not have things go all the way down to the service, be able to pull some things back out, pull some things from my cache, increase the performance of my app, even help reliability if downstream I'm getting pummeled, my cache can get pummeled instead. Same with as you think about processing data. Imagine adding a route service that throws everything in Amazon Kinesis because I'm doing some streaming analytics of the requests that come in. Being able to add some things for more dynamic tracing. Add a route for a few minutes, a route service, because you're trying to instrument a service or trace it and then take it back off. I didn't even have to touch my service. So you're doing some of these things, these sort of cross-cutting capabilities across your services without actually touching the service itself, which is pretty great. And same with things like security. When I'm using something like API management, how am I putting authorization against some of these services without asking my developer to keep doing their own authorization scheme. I have not met many developers, including myself, who are good at doing authorization or authentication. I should be outsourcing that to some sort of cross-cutting, aspect-oriented thing in my system. That's where API management's really helpful. If we look at the experience, the operator experience, really pretty, pretty straightforward. Give me a service, add something as a service broker, be able to add that create the service plans, and as we think about things like API management again, I could have a plan that says, here's a plan for authorization, here's a plan for caching, here's a plan for something else, and as a developer, I'm just binding my service to that particular route, and things are magically then going to happen for everything in that request path. The developer, obviously, I mean, this is what is really gets to be exciting stuff, is developer, you know, once the operator sets this up, developer's good to go. CF Marketplace, there's all my services, whether it's MySQL or Rabbit or Apigee, these are all gonna be route services I can consume. And then I'm just doing create user provided service, passing in the service I wanna use, what's the route I'm gonna refer to, and then bind it. With that, I'm done, and everything's instantaneously gonna hook up, there's no additional work I have to do. And again, I'm doing this in a couple different models. I can do things very straightforward in this kind of simple model where I'm just going to put an appliance even. I could stick a virtual appliance in front of Cloud Foundry, and in this case, everything goes through. And you may want that, where every bit of traffic goes through that particular route service. And you know, things that don't have anything to do, that's fine. It just flows through. Users, customers, you know, developers can still bind their routes to part of this. 
but gives a very straightforward solution. Or you can be more dynamic, where traffic is inspected once it comes into the cloud controller, and if it matches the route, it goes back through the route service, does whatever that route service does, and comes back through. That can be great if you don't want all traffic to go through. So you have a number of different options, and what's really great, too, is that you can do user-defined versions of this. You do not have to buy commercial software, however awesome it is. I can do whatever I'd like here and hook this up to my in-house system. I can hook it up to my in-house instrumentation or my preferred caching tool or whatever. That's really great that I don't have to necessarily wait to see what someone ships. I can build it myself. Yes. Make sure you're talking to the right one. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think this will uh, pick up audio. Um, so uh, we've talked about API management a little bit uh, in terms of um, uh, you know what you're going. What you know we think one of the uh, great uses uh, for uh, route services um, is. So, what is API management? Well, when you look at uh, the challenge of going and uh, making APIs available, um, you know there's a whole set of, of what we call you know non-functional requirements that are part of APIs. A lot of people go and say you know API management. Um, I know how to build a um, an API. I understand. Uh, uh, RESTful API design and so on. Um, you know, what exactly is API management? Why do I need it? And, you know, it really comes down to, uh, you know, three basic things. And, and the first is uh, being able to have consistent security across um, uh, all your APIs. And, um, you know, we see this quite a bit at Apogee where um, uh, sort of insist. Uh, um, basically inconsistent uh, authentication strategies and, and so on across APIs. Uh, it's always, um, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, 90% of your APIs are secure. Um, it's, it's that one other API that somebody spun up, um, even for something completely benign, like maybe even just doing autocomplete or something that suddenly um, people find us an attack vector. Uh, it's having the analytics uh, visibility, and this is uh, from both operational analytics um, in terms of how your APIs are performing, uh, as well as oftentimes, um, as Richard was talking about, extracting a whole bunch of data out of the API stream for doing business analytics. And then finally, it's enabling your ecosystem of developers, being able to have, um, uh, you know, uh, every developer able to go and publish their APIs into a standard location that, um, that other developers can uh, go to to find out information, documentation for the APIs, uh, and um, uh, being able to come and learn how to use these APIs um, in, you know, with interactive documentation that makes it very easy for you to try out API, API calls and so on. And so this is a lot of, uh, you know, what goes into having a uh, successful API strategy. Um, quick aside for, you know, Apogee, we've done this for, for um, a lot of companies and many of the folks um, in the audience here uh, are from uh, organizations that, that are using Apogee for doing this stuff. So what the integration um, with, um, with Cloud Foundry looks like um, really is sort of the um, textbook example of, of how route services um, can work and basically what we do is, um, you know, we expose Apogee's API management uh, platform as a tile within, um, uh, within the Cloud Foundry marketplace. If you're not using Pivotal Cloud Foundry, you can use, um, uh, you can do this via manual install and there's instructions on GitHub how to do it. But once you do that, it's gonna uh, bind a route that causes your inbound API traffic. Um, uh, to go into Apogee where we're able to do things like apply policies for security purposes or data transformation purposes. You know, I said earlier it would be great. Um, everybody should be building their APIs um, uh, using, uh, you know, JSON and so on. But there's a lot of legacy APIs and a lot of legacy application clients uh, that were designed uh, to communicate in, in older protocols and so on. Part of what API management lets you also do is transform um, those requests from uh, perhaps the way they were originally designed to the way you want to support them now. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's all really designed to be natively integrated into your workflow. And so what you're going to see in a minute um, is Carlos is going to step up and show you a demonstration where you're able to go and see that this is really seamless. The goal of this is to make sure that 
every app that you build, um, every API you expose basically has all of these uh, configuration options pre-set up. That it's not one of these things where some developer goes and says, oh, I, you know what, I forgot to set up um, uh, the authentication mechanism. Oops. Um, you know, you don't want that to be happening. So that in mind, uh, here you go, Carlos. All right. Can we get the... There we go? All right, awesome. I, I only have two hands, so I can't hold the mic and, and do this at the same time. Um, so this is the part where really we only need a shell script to do this, but I'm, I'm up to add a little bit of comic relief as we do it. Let's look at uh, exactly what we talked about in terms of a developer experience. We'll hit the marketplace um, and see that there's an Apogee Edge org, or Apogee Edge service there. Uh, so what I'll do is simply you know, create an instance of that. And I'm, I'm passing in a little bit of configuration so it knows you know, who I am and, and what part of Apogee I'm gonna to talk to. So now that I have that, I've got a, uh, a service available that I can use, Demo Edge right there. I have an app out here running, which is a simple little, uh, simple little API. It's kind of similar to the old uh, finger protocol, if you want, where you can hit, it, hit a URL, receive a little bit of information. So now as a, as a developer, I've got this up and running, but I haven't really thought about authentication or anything like that. So the next step is to do a bind of the route service. And I simply pass in, if you saw the demo yesterday, this is, this is the same stuff. The result's gonna be slightly different, but we'll pass this in. It's gonna warn me that it might alter what happens with the traffic, which is, is kind of what I expect. So that's it, now I can still hit this endpoint, same thing happens. It doesn't appear to be any different. But if I come over to the Apogee side of the world and take a look at what I have, I have a new proxy out here that's been created automatically. And if I come in and look at what this has in it, I can see that there's actually some, some policies that have already been defined. This is different from what we did yesterday a little bit. We've, we've exposed an open API specification from that app. And the service broker is smart enough to look for that and look for any kind of definitions about what I have in, in terms of routes or paths in there. So I can see that I've got a cache on the Git side and I've, I've actually got some security on the, on the post side. So I'm requiring some sort of identification on that now. So if I turn on trace, I can kind of see what's happening with this traffic. And if I hit this fast enough, I should see there. Now I've got a little bit of traffic protection thrown on it. From a developer experience, super simple to do. From a consumer side, I haven't changed the way the consumer interacts with that at all. So I, I still share the same URL with them and all that stuff, and I get you know, the benefit of understanding what, how people are using things and, and seeing that you know, we're hitting a cache or we're populating a cache. All of that great stuff comes along for free. And that's it, see, could have been a shell script. So, good morning. So, Lotte and I will spend probably about the uh, next 10 minutes or so to share with you about the uh, API management use cases uh, with the Predix in G Digital. So, just a little bit of background on myself. So, my name is Kevin Yan. Uh, I'm a software architect working at Predix platform team in G Digital. Uh, so, please show a hand. If, uh, have you heard about Predix? Uh, oh, great. Thanks. So there's a, there's a talk yesterday, uh, uh, Mark Thomas Smith, so he did a lightning talk about Predix. So I just want to give you a very quick overview about Predix. So um, Predix is a platform, a platform as a service built on Cloud Foundry. So it provides a, a set of uh, services and the practices to uh, help people to uh, develop industrial IoT application um, in the industrial space. So. Uh, so if you look at the industrial space, end-to-end uh, -end security is very important for us. So we want to have a very uh, secure way to connect to uh, industrial machine on the field. Also, we need to provide very secure way for consumption in terms of different type of system of engagement. Doesn't matter if it's a mobile app or enterprise app. So from end-to-end -end perspective, they have to be very secure. Uh, so you may have heard about the um, uh, smart machine, intelligent machine deployed on the field in the industrial space. So what I mean by in, uh, intelligent machine is, for example, like a wind turbine case there. Uh, it has a collection of a sensor. 
So the sensor can measure either vibration or torque or speed, even noise. So it constantly collects a high speed data. So what Prediction offer is to provide a secure connection directly into the machine. So we can collect high frequency data, we call this a time series data. So if you see that on the, on the close to the machine side, on the edge side, we provide edge analytics. So we can do a very quick response if we see any anomaly. So we can do a very quick response to basically inform operator or even sometimes uh, to do real time control as well to do certain thing about it before a big disaster happen. So also, uh, we, uh, we collect massive amount of data in the cloud side as well. So not just for a single asset, like single wind turbine. We basically collect a fleet of uh, asset information, basically a massive amount. So we apply um, a very advanced uh, in analytics in terms of machine learning techniques to be able to uh, predict the, uh, the machine failure. So imagine if we can predict a certain machine gonna fail, say, in several days, that will be drastically uh, reduce the on-plane downtime, and it's a great value for our customer. So also on the consumption side, we have a set of advanced services to help our customer to build visual visualization application, different set of application, so they can uh, consume the, uh, the insight from the analytics as well. So, uh, so as you can see, Predix is uh, evolving very rapidly, so it's growing very fast. So constantly we have a new service coming to Predix. So API management becomes very important for us in terms of how we consume the API, also how we create a very friendly environment for our developer community so they can either uh, develop new services or consume a new service for their app. So I'm gonna pause here for a little bit, so I'll let the Lothar continue. Hi, Cameron, thank you. Um, just for introduction, my name is Lothar Schubert. I'm also with GE Digital with um, Predix, specifically focusing on the developer community and developer relations team. Uh, just to build on what uh, Kevin said here, uh, what you see here is uh, Predix, of course, a website, and you mentioned most of you are familiar with Predix. Predix actually went just into general availability this year, so it was really only launched in February for external GA, but now you can actually go, they create your account, free trial, all the things that goes with the regular platform. Um, as you can say there, it's built on Cloud Foundry. It was really, really big for us that we built it on Cloud Foundry. It gives us lots of things. Um, for example, the way we deploy predicts is we deploy it in multiple data centers around the world as well. And certainly the multi-cloud approach that uh, Cloud Foundry provides is huge benefit for us from operations, uh, from a deployment perspective. And also um, the companies that we deal with in the industrial space, you can imagine is often a pretty conservative bunch in power generation and aviation, transportation, healthcare, for good reasons, right? I mean, security compliance mandates, all those kind of things. But with Predix now, based on Cloud Foundry, we actually are able now to bring the whole notion of CI, CD, and DevOps into those kind of industries, and Cloud Foundry enables this really well. So it also became really a change ag agent for, uh, if you want, cultural transformation, the way software is being built in those industries. So uh, that's what uh, Predix is. When in the GA, we have been using it internally for a few years, and kind of three reasons why we build it here as compared to just Cloud Foundry purely. If you want, it comes down to three things. One, it's, it's really cloud and edge. As Kevin pointed out, there's lots of edge processing happening on industrial types of equipment. There's a need for real-time processing for storage, often where uh, our machines operate is we might not necessarily have connectivity. Could be on an oil rig or it could be in a mining operations or things such as this. So we need processing on the edge as well. So this whole notion of hybrid cloud in a continuous way and secure connectivity, uh, one thing that we needed to build in there. Secondly is to meet specific the demand from our customers from a security perspective that Kevin pointed about pointed out, but also from compliance in terms of data storage, how they manage uh, all the thing. It's really important, managing data and scale as well. So this is the second one. The third one, which brings us really to the topic, is just the services that we provide with Predix. So there's a whole bunch of services which are built on Predix, which are delivered via our services catalog. Right, so on Predix.io, you find the catalog of services on there. And it's pretty straightforward, right? You go into the service, once you're logged in, your provision 
um, uh, subscribe to the service uh, essentially and uh, then you can uh, bind to the service, you can push the service in your Oracle space and bind to the service and off you go as well. Those so services, uh, majority right now is built by GE, by the Predicts team or by GE businesses and you find some pretty basic stuff there um, like SQL database, Postgres, but you also find more uh, services specifically built for our use cases. Master data management, for example, uh, for assets, industrial assets, which are our asset data management servers, or, for example, time series management, which is really important, or things such as uh, traffic management for intelligent cities, intelligent environments as well. Uh, each of the services, of course, is being exposed via APIs, and we have right now, I don't know right now, it's just 30 or 40 services there, but if you look at the APIs, it's easily hundreds of APIs and more um, by the end of the year. And important also, those services increasingly have been delivered by partners as well, so the whole ecosystem which is evolving around this. Right now you find, for example, services by Pitney Bowes, right? They have a GE customer, now they decided they want to deploy their own services into the catalog as well. Now, all of this, of course, really good um, because <coughs> Excuse me. That's the kind of growth that we are seeing. So February went into GA. We've been using Predicts internally for quite some time there in different areas, uh, aviation, for example, in uh, remote monitoring diagnostics of equipment, of machines, manage and run wind farms, get more output. It's actually pretty cool what you can do just with software updates. You get a few percent more efficiency of your wind farm. And if you think about all the power generated there, just 1% more efficiency in energy creation can power countries such as Canada for free. So it's pretty huge what you can do there. And we saw tremendous growth here, which is good, of course, here, 500% growth in the uh, Predix developer community over just the last few months since the launch here. And we expect this to grow now pretty, uh, pretty steadily with community that we put in there as well, forums, discussion groups, ability to share your own code. And we're gonna run our own developer conference, I had to do the pitch here, end of July, 2,500 people just for predicts. Um, now, what comes with the growth, and Kevin will tell us about that. Thank you, Lothar. So I think uh, everybody has experience about managing massive volume of uh, API, right? Also the uh, massive volume of API invocation. So uh, for our objective is uh, we want to maintain a very consistent user experience to our customer. So, so it doesn't matter, it's a, a million call a day, even a billion call a day. Right? We have to maintain very consistent SLA so that customer doesn't get the performance degradation due to because of high volume of requests. And secondly, it's a fast onboarding. As uh, Lothar mentioned, we uh, have a, a large service going to come in to the Predict. And how we manage API, in, not just about new API, also how we manage about new service, right? Like API versioning, they come from the service, but they change the API. So API versioning, new API introduction, right? So we need to have a very nice framework like Swagger, right? Make our customer very easy to browse it, to use it, to consume it. And entitlement is a big piece as well. How we manage entitlement, entitlement in terms of track, right? Track entitlement, also to be able to uh, grant the entitlement, also to revoke them. So entitlement basically is about subscription. Somebody could subscribe. I want to uh, subscribe to Predix to use uh, maybe a thousand assets per month, something like that. So that's the entitlement. So people can have a different need during different time period. They might want to grow the asset, right? So we have to constantly manage the entitlement here. Uh, multi-tenancy, of course, and I think everybody deal with a multi-tenancy problem. So we want to have a very efficient way to be able to use the same infrastructure we have to try to maintain as many, as many multi-tenancy as possible. Also the uh, isolation of the API, right, resources is important, part of multi-tenancy. And uh, lastly, it's important about API analytics because we're getting a large volume of API so how do we know who is using what? What is the trending? What is the hot API I've been using? Somebody might use certain APIs at 3 o'clock in the morning. We want to know about that too. And while everything is, uh, again, we have to maintain the end-to-end -end security. That's very important for us. 
So this kind of show you the uh, high level view. I kind of uh, overlay the, uh, the previous end to end architecture to show you where we kind of uh, deploy our API management. So basically on the left hand side, that's uh, basically our primary our machine connection. So there's a high volume of data coming to a predix, either in streaming manner or in batch upload. So we have an API gateway there really to check the data is coming from the uh, trusted sources. So when data coming, we establish identity right away. And then basically uh, when data coming to the cloud environment, so we'll have very nice uh, data governance policy. We make sure the data access right is uh, ensured. So make sure this person has a right to use the data. And also on the uh, consumption side, that's on your right hand side. So we also have a very secure way for people to use our service, as you showed earlier in the previous catalog. So every service has a, based on the, uh, the token-based authentication and the security, as well as a role-based access control. So there's a several key thing here is about, for example, service virtualization. We want to separate the, um, the API from the actual service provider as well. So our consumer can always deal with a very consistent API without worry about the complexity in the back end. And uh, authentication, as I mentioned earlier. Then the plain enforcement is an interesting topic. So we constantly metering the API usage. So plain enforcement doesn't mean we have to cut off the invocation. We can basically provide a way to tell our customer, say, when you reach to a certain threshold, maybe a yellow, about 80% of usage, we can start sending out a friendly reminder to our customer, remind them, hey, you're close to your subscription, maybe you can do something about it. And uh, since we're getting a large volume, so, so content attack prevention is important to be able to uh, arrest the high spiking of the API request, right? So we can do something about it. Then SLA management we want to make sure we have a consistent response time. And uh, lastly, it's always important is a high availability and scale for us. So we want to constantly grow the API service into a large volume. So that's a pretty much a conclude our use Thank case. you. Thank you. That was a, um, a great summary of, um, of uh, how GE is um, creating an API uh, run business. And so, you know, to summarize, we, we showed you today, um, uh, you know, why API management is relevant to what you're doing with Cloud Foundry, uh, how route services are uh, really key uh, way for uh, bringing these systems together and probably um, uh, something that if you haven't looked too deeply into that uh, you really should, um, or at least hopefully after seeing this presentation, it's high on your list of things to, uh, to investigate uh, when you get back um, to your offices. And, uh, and finally, um, you know, how an API run business, um, how, how GE is able to um, uh, build on top of this um, to have a unified platform uh, for uh, delivering these services, managing, monitoring, and securing them. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions, and then afterwards uh, all of us are available and you can find us uh, uh, in the hall if you've got additional questions. So, uh, Yes, there's a microphone right there, I think, um, if you want. It's a question for you, Richard. Yeah, it was a question on what kind of traffic the route services support. Today, it's through HTTP routing. I actually just checked with the product team this morning to ask about some of the container-to-container -container networking and how might that play in the future with this. And we are thinking of ways to also let that get injected in the path if you wanted to. So today, it's HTTP tra HTTPS, HTTP traffic. In the future, though, as we do more container-to-container -container things, we don't want to lose this or have a, too many opportunities to bypass it. All right. That's it. All right. Thanks, everybody.